All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another Rafael Medina subspecialty case discussion. The focus of today's discussion is infectious disease. And we have three wonderful clinicians from Emory here who will who we will all learn from. Um, as a case presenter, we have Dr. Alex Berman, and we have two case discussants today, Dr. Amalia Aldridge and Dr. Annalise Roque. Uh, so before we dive into the case, I'm going to pass the mic to each of them to share a little bit about their interests and what um, what drove you to infectious disease or why you're interested in infectious disease. Um, so maybe we will start with um, Amalia. Sure. Um, I am a third year fellow, so I'm in my last year of ID fellowship. I have always been drawn to ID because I love the people in it. I love doing detective work all the time. Um, and then I am within ID mostly interested in HIV and PrEP and med ed. And I think I really am drawn to that because HIV still has so much stigma around it and closely intertwined with various social disparities. And so I've just been really drawn to that area within ID. Amazing. Thank you so much, Amalia. And, and thank you for being here. Um, next, we'll pass the mic to Annalise. Annalise, do you mind um, sharing a bit about your interests and also uh, why you're interested in ID? Absolutely. I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, I apologize if you hear a dog or a baby barking in the background. Um, uh, so I, I share a lot of the same interests, actually, that Amalia does. I think a lot of us ID docs at our cores, we are detectives. Uh, and that's what we really enjoy. We enjoy the sleuthing aspect of medicine. And uh, I think a lot of us uh, are, are, are fans of uh, X-Files and detective series and they're in our free time and that's uh that's how we ended up here uh but i i, I also would say that i am primarily a, a a doctor for people who are living with hiv and i think that's uh my core my passion uh and that has a lot to do with some of the things amalia mentioned uh taking care of people that uh, a lot of times are uh at the fringes of society that are marginalized and uh have a lot of social challenges and i what i really get a lot of joy out of in my day to day is my clinic life um, and the inpatient life where I'm able to uh, hopefully make a, a, dif a difference, I'll, I'll bite small in the lives of these folks. And within the subset of people living with HIV, I have a special interest in um, taking care of Latinx folks living with HIV as I'm a primary Spanish speaker. Uh, and that is um, an area that uh, has even more uh, uh, challenges uh, in, in the world that Amalia and I inhabit here in the Southeast, which is as many of you know, the, the center of the HIV epidemic in the United States. Thank you so much, Annalise, for being here. And we're really excited to learn from you. Um, and the case discussant today is Alex Berman. Alex, would you like to unmute, uh, introduce yourself, and also share a bit about your, a bit about your interests? Sure. Uh, thank you, Maddie. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a uh, second year resident at Emory um, in internal medicine, also interested in going into infectious diseases. Um, I thought this case was uh, very, very cool in the realm of ID. Uh, specifically, my interests are in global health, um, in uh, neglected tropical diseases, um, but also I spend a good amount of time rotating in our infectious diseases in HIV clinic. So that's of interest as well. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Really excited for the case. So um, we will dive right in. Uh, Noah, thank you so much for scribing. You can go ahead and share your screen. Uh, and then Alex, whenever you're ready, you can uh, jump into the first aliquot. Sure. One second. Um, yeah. So the chief complaint is a chest mass. So uh, I have a 31-year-old male uh, with a history of HIV. The most recent CD4 count is 11 uh, from two months prior, who was recently started on antiretroviral medication, who presented with a right uh, wall, a, a right chest wall mass that started off as discoloration and a small nodule about six months prior. He reported that the mass is associated with yellow drainage and bleeds when he picks at it, and it began growing into a mass after three to four months. 
Perfect, Alex. And maybe we can um, pause here to get some initial thoughts. So Amalia, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. And really would, would love to hear how you're thinking about the patients presenting symptom this mass in the context of their CD4 cell count and what that tells you. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start with, I feel like this is not necessarily an infrequent presentation that we see. And so um, the first thing I guess that I think of when I think of skin, skin or chest wall, visible lesions is their duration. And it sounds like this has been going on for a long time. It's been going on for four months. So um, I think less about like typical bacterial infections. And instead I'm thinking more of atypical bacterial infections, fungal infections, mycobacteria. Um, so somewhere in that family. Um, the CD4 definitely, you know, influences me. I guess one question, I do find it interesting to know their percent of CD4 as well, like the number and the percent, just because I think it gives a good sense of really how immunosuppressed they are. But I think no matter what, with a CD4 of 11, this person is quite immunosuppressed. And so I just think about um, all of those things that I just said, or is this something that's more normal that this person just has a, you know, an abnormal uh, attenuated immune response? And could this be something that's more normal that is just um, presenting in a little bit of a different way? Yeah, I perfect. My one other question is if there's anything anywhere else, because that might also influence the differential. <laughs> yeah, and one one quick follow-up question I had, Amalia, is you mentioned that you um, the CD4 percent could help you. Do you mind talking a little bit more about how the CD4 percent can help you? Yeah, okay. I will say this may be a Southeastern thing, but we, we talk about it a lot down here, and um, we see a lot of people with quite advanced HIV here, so... The reason I look at a percent is that the absolute CD4 number itself can be falsely low in people that are sick with some other reason. And so the percent is much more stable. And so I think it's just a better representation of their true CD4. Um, a rough estimate, at least what I was always taught, is that um, every 7%, CD4 percent is about 100 CD4 cells. So for example, if you have a CD4 of seven, you can think that their CD4 is maybe around 100, or if it was 14%, it's around 200. And so I just find that useful. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Amalia. Well, I know we have a lot more to the case, so maybe we'll turn it back to Alex um, for the next aliquot. Sure. So this is part of the, I guess, review of systems and pertinent positives and negatives. So the patient also noted an exfoliating rash that had emerged on his arms and trunk he denies headaches, but reports blurry vision with eye tearing and redness. He also reports that his lips and tongue are also painful and swollen. He's had no sick contacts. He endorses fever, night, uh, night sweats, chills, a 30 pound weight loss uh, over the time that he's had this uh, mass, as well as a dry cough that only recently became productive of clear sputum. Perfect. And Alex, you can actually give us um, a bit more information up until right before the exam, if that's all right with you. Sure, of course. Um, his home medications, um, he's on Bictegravir, Emtricitabine, and uh, Tenofovir, aka Bictarvi. He is also on Trimethoprim, Sulfamethoxazole as his home meds. He has no pertinent uh, past surgical history, no known drug allergies. Uh, and for his family history, uh, his mother died at the age of 59 from Parkinson's disease complications. His father died uh, at the age of 59 from an MI. His brother is in good health and he has no children. I'll give you a chance, sorry, to catch up from scribing. Um, and then regarding his social history, he was diagnosed with HIV 10 years prior. He was on antiretrovirals in the past, but then lost access to care and then resumed antiretrovirals two months ago on Bictarvi. 
He lives in Georgia with his brother and a roommate. He has uh, sex with women, uh, but no sexual activity for over a year because he had been feeling sick. Um, he has oral receptive and penetrative sex with women. No travel outside of Georgia in recent memory. Um, he has never been incarcerated, uh, served in active military, or experienced homelessness. He has occasional alcohol use, um, occasional cannabis use, and smokes a quarter pack of cigarettes uh, per day for several years. No IV drug use and is currently unemployed. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, so Annalise, we'll turn it over to you now. And we have quite a bit more information about additional symptoms, such as the rash, night sweats, the painful lips and tongue. So really curious how you're thinking about this patient and what differentials are on your mind right now. May I ask, Alex, is, do you have a viral load for this patient? Uh, one second. Let me find it. Yes, it was less than 1.3 log. Okay. All right. So uh, the reason I asked that and to, to frame my thoughts uh, are uh, going back to Amalia's discussion of percentage in CD4, the viral load is also number one telling me, is he taking his medication? Which in the context of this is actually really important because it could inform our differential diagnosis. This is a really good timeline for, uh, for IRIS. And so that's something that we really have to consider. But uh, I think sort of the broad point that I want to make for a patient like this, which we see very commonly, in fact, too commonly here in the Southeast, is that Occam's razor does not apply. So we're not looking for a unifying diagnosis unnecessarily where you're going to get all these symptoms and they're going to fit into a nice little package and you're going to get one differential. We, we, may, we may get there, uh, but in my mind, as a, a, a doctor that sees a lot of these patients, I, I, I don't try to put them in one bucket. So for this person, I'm thinking, is the, is the chest mass one thing? And then are the other symptoms in different buckets? So the exfoliating rash, is that in a different bucket? Or is it perhaps tied to, uh, to an iris-like picture, as I said? Uh, or uh, also thinking about the systemic symptoms that he's having, the fever, the nights with the chills, the weight loss, and the dry cough, is that also in another bucket? So I'm not thinking as uh, these symptoms uh, as all together necessarily. Um, this, the first thing that sticks to my mind is this is a really good story for Iris. Also thinking about TB risk factors and someone like this, um, MAC. Uh, uh, so atypical thinking in terms of um, larger diagnosis, atypical causes, as Amalia said. I, I think less likely bacterial causes. Uh, so we're looking at atypical mycobacterium. Uh, less likely probably bacterial causes because the timeline is more chronic rather than acute in this situation. Thinking fungal causes uh, in this patient in Georgia here, as opposed to um, my prior home state of California, this is not uh, uh, coxie country. So we're not thinking about uh, coccidiomycosis. We're thinking more histo. Does he have, um, it doesn't seem like he has any other travel history uh, sometimes we get some uh, uh, histo cases here, but it's really rare. And then sometimes we see blasto, but again, really rare. So we're thinking maybe less endemic mycoses. Um, and then thinking about, is the mass something that's more typical, such as a cancer? So in patients with this level of immunosuppression, we're thinking of um, diffuse large B cell lymphomas, which can present in this population. Uh, and then that being a more non-infectious etiology of the mass and then everything else more of an infectious uh, uh, bucket. And so uh, I think at this point, I don't know enough uh, to, to know how to put these symptoms together. But in my mind, I tried to not anchor on one thing, particularly in these patients. Yeah, thank you so much. I love that you highlighted that in and a patient like this who's immunocompromised, there can be many different things going on. I want to follow up on um, what you mentioned about the timeline for IRIS. And could you elaborate a little bit more about what exactly is an expected timeline for, for IRIS and how would that generally present? So I think infectious disease docs have been talking about this for, for eons and what, uh, what IRIS exactly is. 
uh, and what the timeline is. And I think in my mind, I think about it more in the like the two week to uh, the two month timeline. That's a good that's a good time. And it's called uh, it's an inflammatory reaction. Uh, and I, I explain it to patients and to, to students as your immune system is waking up. Your immune system was dormant. And now you're taking your antiretrovirals, which we know this patient is, and that immune system is reemerging. And with that comes a, a lot of systemic inflammation, which has a host of causes. And you can get iris pictures um, with uh, tuberculosis. You can uh, get iris pictures with a, a host of other uh, of other um, uh, infectious diseases. Recently, uh, there is a very interesting um, uh, pattern that we're seeing here actually in Atlanta of PJP iris, which is something that is not um, well documented. Thank you so much. I guess one last question. Um, we'll get more information about the mass from Alex, but you talked about how it could be you know, malignancy, it could be infection, maybe something else. If we're thinking about the infection bucket for this mass, though we're not sure it is yet, are there certain types of infections that are more likely to cause a mass than others? Or can really any of those categories of infections do it? Absolutely. I think to the top of my of my brain, what jumps out is um, uh, Kaposi's. So we're, uh, we're thinking of herpes virus driven uh, mass uh, in a patient like this, who has a severely depressed uh, uh, immune system. So thinking about that, and then uh, I it's, I, I would think it's less common in a patient with less of TB risk factors, but you can think about something like scrofula uh, as well. You can think about atypical mycobacteriums. Um, he doesn't seem like he's got any interesting hobbies like cleaning fish or fishing that would make him exposed to a lot of these atypical mycobacteriums. Uh, so I, 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 but I also think of those as causing masses again, less bacterial because bacterial is the typical abscess like picture that we think of. And that has a natural progression, even in patients that are severely immunosuppressed, they would get worse and worse and worse. And then it likely, it would be unlikely to have lasted six months. Thank you so much. All right, Alex, back to you. Sure. So this uh, patient presented to the emergency department with these vitals. Uh, so his temperature was 37.6 Celsius or 99.7 Fahrenheit. His blood pressure was 117 over 82. His heart rate was 109. Respiratory weight was 20. And he was satting 97% on room air. So overall, he was pretty chronically ill appearing. Um, he was lying in bed and he had intermittent rigors. On his head, he had alopecia and scabs on his scalp, which I will go into in the uh, skin uh, exam, and bitemporal wasting. In the eyes, he had conjunctival injection and tearing bilaterally, uh, serous tearing. Um, he had no nasal discharge a dry rugated tongue. His lips were cracked with modest thrush. There were no ulcers or uh, hyperpigmented lesions in the mouth. His neck was supple. He had no cervical, occipital, preauricular, so supraclavicular adenopathy, but did have non-tender mobile right axillary and inguinal adenopathy. He was tachycardic with no murmurs. Um, pulses were strong and bilateral radial pulses. He, pulmonary wise, he was breathing comfortably on ambient air with frequent coughing, and he had bilateral lower lung field inspiratory fine cockles. His abdomen was soft, non distended, non tender, normal bowel sounds in all four quadrants. His extremities were warm, and there were no splinter hemorrhages noted. He had no synovitis in the small and medium joints of the upper and lower extremities. And then his uh, skin findings, which is meat of where everything was, he had a large five by five centimeter, um, four centimeter in height, fungating exophytic friable mass with a thick stalk on the right chest wall with minimal yellow drainage. He had a desquamation over the soles of bilateral feet 
and erythema with desquamation over the medial portions of bilateral hands and lateral portion of his left hand, um, specifically between the first and second digits. And he had some hyper uh, pigmentation with small violet papules over the chest and upper abdomen. This was also noted on the scalp. And Maddie, if you could share those images, please. Yes, definitely. Let me do that right now. Um, okay. Can you all see this? Okay, I'm just gonna scroll through here and Alex, feel free to comment anything you want about the photos. Yeah, so the second photo is the uh, the scalp uh, uh, findings on the skin. And the desquamation scene on the soles was very similar to what we found on the uh, on the palms. And the last one was after it was uh, wrapped and photographed by the emergency department. Perfect. Alex, did you want to pause here? Did you want to give any initial labs? Whatever you prefer. I'm happy okay, to give sure. the labs. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> because there's well, a lot. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, why don't you give the initial labs? Okay. Uh, so his initial white blood cell count was 11.3, but had a normal differential. His hemoglobin was a, uh, was 10.4 with a, a, an MCV of 88. His platelets were 306. His sodium was 134. Potassium was 4.2. Chloride of 99. Bicarb of 28. B1 of 6. Fatnine of 0.6, albumin was low at 2.8, protein was 7.7, .7. T bilia at 0.5, D bilia at 0.2, AST mildly elevated at 43, ALT was 22, ALK FOS 141, UA was normal, and the lactic acid level was 2.3. EKG showed sinus tachycardia, no other findings and blood cultures uh, times two were collected and ultimately became negative. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Alex. And Noah, whenever um, whenever you can, you can reshare your screen again so we can see the whiteboard. Um, but Amalia, we'll go back to you and curious how you're interpreting this, uh, this physical exam and how you're thinking about the patient now. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty striking <laughs> physical exam. Like the pictures are pretty striking and um, does make me definitely think about non-infectious things along with infectious things. Um, so still, especially like, I know that some, I think some of the skin lesions were described as darker or like violaceous. <laughs> and so I definitely think about Kaposi's um and especially with this like uh shortness of breath this dry cough because these can also affect the lungs so I do think about that but I also think about other malignancies which may be a little less likely just given the exam but certainly still possible um infectious wise I guess one thing that we didn't specifically talk about before is syphilis, which I do think about like Louis wow. Maligna. Sorry, my dog is barking. <laughs> um, I do think about syphilis can cause something called Louis Maligna, which is like chronic skin manifestations that can be big and fungating like this um, and can last for a long time. So I guess that is something that's certainly possible. And the, the other thing that I like with the liver enzymes being a little bit up, I think about that as well. Although Usually I think of it more with like um, like the elk foss and the T belly being up rather than the AST, ALT, so maybe a little less likely, um, but definitely something to think about. Uh, otherwise, I don't know that this changes too much other than getting a little bit more like non-invasive lab work, seeing what that looks like. And if that's unrevealing, then I think we will be itching to get a biopsy. Yeah, fantastic. And um, perfect. Well, I know we have a lot more information. So Alex, why don't we go back to you for the next aliquot? Sure. 
So this involves uh, some additional more labs and an ED course. So the LDH was 500, CPK was normal at 49, TSH was normal at 2.1, and the chest X-ray showed a multifocal pulmonary nodules. In the ED, he received ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and zosin for presumed pneumonia. Soon after, he developed tachycardia to the 150s, hypotension to a max of 50 to 60s, which was ultimately refractory to fluids, and he had an increase in lactic acid from 2.3 to 3.6, in which he briefly required pressure support and an ICU transfer. His pressures very quickly stabilized, though, and he was transferred back to the floor. Yeah, so um, at this point, Annalise, maybe we can turn it to you. And here, I would love to hear your interpretation of kind of the choice, both the choice of empiric antibiotics and how you're thinking of this, um, you know, kind of decompensation, um, this new decompensation that the patient's experiencing. So I, I think in the, within the context of being a needy doc and seeing this presentation of a very acutely ill um, gentleman, I, I I think that's a, a fine choice. I, I would probably have added some uh, more atypical coverage in there um, uh, myself, um, given his level of immunosuppression. But I, I'm I'm. I'm very doubtful that this is a presumed bacteria. This is actually a presumed bacterial pneumonia, uh, given the 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 entire the picture that's happening here. I do have a suspicion that there's probably several things going on. I think uh, much like Amalia stated, those pictures are very striking. I think to my mind, um, syphilis jumps jump to the bottom to the top of the of the differential because those look like that look like a, a gumma to me essentially. Um, and then additionally, the desquamation um, is something that I, uh, desquamation, desquamation and um, the um, balding areas on the scalp, very consistent with uh, an advanced syphilis uh, presentation. Uh, but that I don't attribute that to causing the acute decompensation in a patient. And so that makes me think that there's another picture happening here. Could there be another component of, um, of as we talked about, iris uh, uh, or KS even that's leading to the acute decompensation. I will say I've seen a number of patients since I came here to the Southeast that have disseminated Kaposi's and have a very similar presentation with um, diffuse pulmonary nodules, uh, uh, skin manifestations that get very, very, very sick, very, very fast. Um, but uh, I, I think those, those are very striking pictures um, in my mind. Great. All right, Alex, back to you. Sure. So more imaging and some more uh, labs. So first for the labs, um, the urine, gonorrhea, and chlamydia was negative. Toxoplasma IgG was negative. Urine histoplasma antigen was negative. Serum cryptococcal antigen was negative. IL-6 was obtained and it was positive at 525. RPR was positive, and the titer was more, greater than 1 to 512. Uh, HB, uh, so, uh, sorry, hepatitis B surface antigen uh, was negative. Hepatitis B core antibody was negative. Hep C antibody was negative. Hep C surface antibody was positive. Sorry, hep B, yeah, hep B surface antibody was positive. Uh, his repeat CD4 count uh, was 61, and for that uh, percentage, it was 2%. Uh, I mentioned the viral load at less than 1.3 log. G6PD was normal. Uh, Bartonella, um, Hensley, IgG um, to IgM titer was 1 to 128. Bartonella, Quintana, was, uh, the titer was 1 to 64, and IGRA was negative. For CT chest, uh, there was a five centimeter right anterior chest wall mass invading into the skin and subcutaneous fat, as well as diffuse bilateral peribronchovascular nodules and masses. They also noted multi-station bilateral axillary mediastinal and hyaluronopathy. 
CT abdomen and pelvis showed hepatomegaly, diffuse prominent lymph nodes, most notable in the mesenteric root, as well as cholelithiasis without acute cholecystitis. And I will pause there. Oh, and uh, CT head and MRI head were negative for intracranial abnormalities. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, Amalia, we'll, we'll turn to you. And given that, you know, Alex has given us so much data in the case so far, I think it would be really helpful for the audience and for all the learners if you could kind of summarize how you are thinking about the patient right now. Um, and then we'll be uh, really interested to hear how you're interpreting the data, specifically some of the things like the RPR. Sure. Um, so I would summarize this. This is a young man with a 10 year history of HIV who recently restarted medications, now with a CD4 of 61, 2% and an undetectable viral load, who comes in with a subacute progressive uh, chest wall mass, along with um, a more diffuse rash, blurry vision, and um, uh, what am I trying to say? Like B symptoms. <laughs> um, I, when I start, so like Annalise said from the beginning, I find it really hard to do this all Put this all together so when I write these notes I start separating each thing out um and so I guess first I don't know that I have for this um like chest wall mass I think the one new thing that this this gives or two new things that this additional lab information gives us is one still keep syphilis on the table with this high titer RPR. Um, so I think it's possible that it's syphilis, but I don't think, I still don't think it's like a slam dunk that this is due to syphilis. I think he has syphilis. I just don't know if this chest wall mass is related to that. Um, a second piece of information here that comes out is this um, Bartonella titers. And so I guess we have not brought up if this could be due to something like Bartonella. Um, And I guess the one thing, I mean, at the very beginning of the history, the patient said when they were scratching it, it bled a lot. And so I guess, you know, you could think about something like bacillary angiomatosis, although I've never seen bacillary angiomatosis, but I think of it, at least what I've always been taught is that it would be like smaller, um, but definitely very vascular and bleeds very easily. So, I mean, Something to think about, and that tighter to me is like a little high, but not super, super high. And so I don't quite know what to do with that. Is this just like they've been exposed to Bartonella in the past? Um, we didn't hear that they have like a kitten, although that history actually almost never <laughs> happens, even when people have it. Um, and then the last thing that stuck out to me for this chest mass in particular in the clinical presentation is this IL-6. I don't look... I don't memorize the normal values for IL-6. So I actually don't know if this is like very high or just a little bit high, but it does make me think again about Kaposi sarcoma and um, like Kaposi's inflammatory cytokine syndrome that can happen, especially when people are put on meds. And it's sort of, I think of it a little bit as a type of Kaposi's iris. And it's just like a very hyperinflammatory syndrome and you can get high IL-6 levels. So again, I don't, I can't say what that chest mass is yet. Um, and then just to circle back to the RPR for a second, this RPR of 1 to 512, like I said, certainly has syphilis. Um, and if that chest wall mass is related to it, if it, uh, I don't know. There's a bunch of different things in here. He had blurry vision. I'm like, does he have ocular syphilis? Certainly possible. I, anyone that comes in with a CD4 less than 50 with vision complaints, like ophthalmology needs to do a dilated eye exam and take a look. So I would certainly have them do that. Um, syphilis can have some pretty characteristic findings. And I think if there's anything that looks like it even could be syphilis, then he would buy himself treatment for ocular syphilis. 
Um, there was no headache or other obvious neurologic findings. I don't think that this like jumps to an LP. I just don't know how the patient would be treated quite yet. Uh, and then I'm just looking through now. Yeah, I think those are my thoughts for now. They're a little scattered, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. That was so brilliant. And there's so much data here. And I see you kind of going back and forth, like, could this all be one thing? Are there multiple processes going on? So really, really a, a brilliant discussion. Um, just for, I think it would be a helpful learning point for learners at different levels of training here. Could you talk a little bit about how you interpret an RPR value, like what the titer shows and kind of the difference between treponemal and non-treponemal tests? I think that's often a confusing topic. <laughs> yeah, we get called about it a lot too. Um, actually love, I love it. Um, each center does it a little bit differently. I will say um, at the, at our hospitals, usually we do a non-treponemal test first. So what we'll get back first is an RPR. So um, the way that I think about RPRs is I think about someone has a test tube of water and someone has put like a drop of food coloring into it and then they dilute that test tube in half so then it goes from like one test tube to two test tubes and you fill it back up with water and then you split it again and split it again and um however many tubes you can still see the uh, food coloring is like a positive test still and I think of the food coloring as syphilis and so like the higher the tighter is like the more number of test tubes that you can still see this food coloring or syphilis in it so the higher the number the the more syphilis is around because you need to dilute it more and so um I mean any positive can certainly be a syphilis like a syphilis infection I will say you know someone might have previously had syphilis and still have a positive RPR, and it might be something like one to one, one to two, one to four. But once you start getting above that, it's often, but not always, like a more, um, I don't know, it catches my eye a little bit more. Um, that being said, I've also certainly had people with a positive RPR. So it's like, let's say it's one to four. And I always wait for the treponemal antibody to come back after the RPR because um, if that is negative, that is just looking at syphilis. If that's negative, then the RPR like doesn't mean that they have syphilis. So um, you do need to have a positive treponemal antibody to say that someone has syphilis. So uh, I'm just looking at this one. I am assuming, although I guess we did not clarify if this person then had a reflex treponemal antibody. Um, Thank you so much. All right, before Alex gives the next Alquat, um, Annalise, is there what would you be what would you want as a next step for this patient? So, uh, just to go back to Amalia's discussion in a sec. Um, so, I, I actually have seen uh, basilar angiomatosis uh, in fellowship, um, but it was not in this context, and I, it's not the host that I. It can certainly happen in patients with this level of immunosuppression. But I actually saw it more uh, in a host um, uh, who was a, a liver transplant patient. And I will say uh, I, the lesions were not as impressive as this. Uh, my N is very small. This is obviously a very rare diagnosis. Um, but I, I, I think certainly, as Amalia pointed out, we have, um, we have some manifestations that are skin manifestations that are likely due to syphilis. Uh, and some which could be due to uh, to that positive Bartonella. Um, I just one little tidbit that um, is not something that you're going to find in in books, but um, I'm a product of Ward 86 at UCSF, and the old ID attendings will say that in someone who um, has an RPR of one to sixty four who has advanced stage HIV, it's um, it's an eye exam and an LP until proven otherwise because uh, essentially that the burden of, of, um, of syphilis is high enough that you are concerned about um, a more serious manifestations in someone with, with this uh, level of uh, immunosuppression. I think all roads here are gonna end up with a biopsy of one of those lymph nodes uh, or of that 
uh, of that mass, whatever is easiest for our derm colleagues to get to or our general surgery colleagues, because here we have several tests um, and several things that this that could tie this together. You could have uh, 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 multiple presentations. So I think biopsy probably would be next. Thank you both so much for the brilliant discussion so far. All right, Alex, back to you. Yes, you are all right. The the that all occurred afterwards. So yes, the uh, a treponemal antibody was positive. Uh, so we did obtain an LP, uh, which showed uh, four white blood cells in the CSF, fourteen red blood cells, a protein level fifty six, and a glucose level of fifty four. Uh, the uh, LP showed a VDRL C, uh, CSF titer of one to four. And we also obtained a bronchoscopy and a BIL showed no bacterial, viral, or fungal organisms. PJP PCR was negative. Ophthalmology was consulted, did, a, uh, did an uh, eye exam and found bilateral optic disc edema. And lastly, derm was consulted and performed a punch biopsy. All right, so I believe, Alex, this is the last bit of information before the final diagnosis is released. Awesome. Um, Annalise, so we'll jump to you first this time uh, and would love your interpretation of the of the LP. So not shocked by this, given what I just said, uh, but essentially here we have a, a, a pleocytosis uh, with a mildly elevated protein uh, and uh, more notably a positive VDRL. CSF VDRL, which helps you if it's positive, doesn't help you if it's negative. But here, it being positive, um, does help us uh, to to know that there is a CS there is a um, uh, CSF uh, involvement uh, with the syphilitic picture. And so, um, given his eye symptoms, I'm guessing um, uh, probably ocular syphilis. Uh, given that uh, the person didn't have any other uh, neuro findings, so. Uh, I'm not thinking of this as a bacterial um, or a viral meningitis in patients. Um, I will note that uh, a tidbit is in patients um, with this level of immunosuppression with HIV, um, even a, a WBC of four uh, is impressive uh, in the CSF. Um, that uh, in a patient with a normal level, uh, normal immune system, you would hit him and haw about, but in a patient that essentially can't mount uh, an immune response, uh, we actually worry quite a bit with the WBC04. Fantastic. And how, um, before Alex gives us kind of a summary of what happened, how would you approach the, the treatment of this patient? So uh, definitely getting uh, um, IV penicillin uh, for treatment of, um, of uh, uh, likely ocular syphilis here, uh, or neurological manifestations of syphilis, which is going to be the same treatment. Um, you're going to get 14 days of um, IV penicillin. Uh, uh, that is at baseline. And then uh, thinking about um, the acute presentation, it seems like they stabilize um, after their, uh, their ED uh, picture and then their short stint in the ICU, I think it's it's reasonable to maintain broad spectrum antibiotics um, for a time being. And then I would also add, um, add a little splash of doxy in there, um, uh, it, given the concern um, for bacillarian geomatosis and a Bartonella picture. Um, and then we keep those on until we, we have more information um, uh, in this uh, situation. I think that punch biopsy will, will be key. All right, fantastic. Well, Alex, um, would love to hear how what happened next and how the team was thinking about the case. Yeah, so the uh, punch biopsy showed a diagnosis of Kaposi sarcoma, low cytometry without atypical cells, and a lymph node biopsy from the BAL also showed Kaposi sarcoma. Um, uh, the LP was indicative of ocular syphilis. So the patient was uh, treated with uh, 24 million units of IV penicillin G for 14 days. Um, and with regards to the, uh, to, with regards to the Kaposi sarcoma, Bactrim, sorry, B yeah, Bactrim and Bactarvi were continued. 
Uh, he was started on liposomal doxorubicin and eventually was switched uh, to paclitaxel after treatment of syphilis. Uh, and then he continued to follow at ID clinic and did very well. And also the decompensation um, at the beginning of his um, emergency uh, course was attributed to the Jarrett's uh, Herxheimer reaction after ceftriaxone administration. Wow, Alex, what a case. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, Amali, I would love to turn it over to you to just get your initial reflections. And um, I was wondering if you could kind of explain to all the learners a little bit about what the Jarek's, oh my gosh, a hard time saying it, Jarek's Herxheimer reaction in, what exactly that is and like why it happens. Yeah, very nice case. A nice presentation, Alex. Um, uh, this makes... I mean, I think this makes sense and just highlights what we've said of patients with advanced immunosuppression can have many, many different things. Um, so I think this makes sense. And um, I guess the one thing that I will highlight is we still see a lot of Kaposi sarcoma down here. And a lot of the time we just start people on antiretrovirals and then it gets better. But for people with more extensive disease like this, um, that's when you use things like chemo, like doxorubicin or paclitaxel. And um, so I just want to highlight that because I think in some places we don't see that as much anymore. Um, Yarish Hirsch Hirschheimer, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, <laughs> um, is for people with, uh, in individuals that have a high level of spirochetes in their blood, this is most often seen with syphilis and people with high titers of syphilis like this patient, um, when you give them a medicine that is active against the spirochetes as the spirochetes die quickly, they get this um, like inflammatory reaction to the dying spirochetes. And so, yes, we usually use penicillin or we think of penicillin as treating syphilis, but ceftriaxone certainly has some action against those spirochetes, and so it's kind of interesting. I did recently learn that you can induce preterm labor if you give a pregnant person, if you treat a pregnant person with usually syphilis and induce a urinary Herzheimer, they can go into preterm labor. Uh, thank, thank you so much for that explanation, Amalia. And Annalise, would love to hear your reflection on this case. And I'm also curious in your experience, kind of if this is, um, a typical presentation for Kaposi sarcoma, or if you were surprised by this presentation, would, would love to hear your, your reflections on that. Unfortunately, not surprised at all. As Amalia noted, we see a lot of Kaposi's here in the Southeast. And uh, this presentation, I think when the multifocal pulmonary nodules were noted and the hepatomegaly, this, this could be five of my clinic patients. Um, one of them that uh, I'm thinking of, who was a young man, a little bit younger than this patient who walked in to my office uh, with uh, uh, advanced HIV uh, um, violaceous uh, skin manifestations everywhere. Uh, and then once we did a pan scan, it looked exactly like this. And so uh, unfortunately not uncommon here. Uh, I think the interesting aspect of this and the little little nugget that or the red herring that threw us off was the, the Bartonella serologies um, but uh, this this is a, a very common presentation, I, I, I think, of, of Kaposi's. And I also would note something that Amalia said, because it, it's not very common. And I think in places in the country that don't see as much advanced HIV as we do here, ticks or the, the iris picture that comes with Kaposi's, that, um, that uh, 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 part of, this, of the case where he became hypotensive, refractory to fluids, um, that is also a perfect um, manifestation of kicks. The fact that he got better so quickly, obviously not a, a, a manifestation of kicks, but we would be extremely worried if someone decompensated like that, that, they, um, that they're presenting with kicks as well. So um, I, I think it's a fantastic case, um, but also is something that we commonly see here on the wards. Uh, I think the the syphilis um, uh, manifestation and the multiple OIs in this patient is, um, is something that is all too common here uh, in our hospitals. 
Thank you both. Um, well, Alex, would love to hear if you had any reflections on what it was like caring for this patient. And then before we end the session, I'll pass it to Molly and Elise one last time to highlight one or two teaching points they want to emphasize. Um, but yeah, Alex, what was it like for you to, to take care of this patient? Yeah, well, first of all, it was a very interesting seeing everything unfold since I was there from uh, on consults when it first occurred and then ultimately handed off the patient to our inpatient HIV services, but I did follow peripherally for a while. Um, one question that um, was asked to this patient later on, especially after he started in treatment and getting better, was uh, why wait uh, so long to uh, present? And ultimately, he reiterated this to me. Uh, he was scared. Um, there was, uh, since he knew something bad was going on, and he uh, it, it wasn't fully in denial, but knew that if he won and he may have uh, uh he may have uh, the answer at that point. And because of this, it also took some time to develop a therapeutic relationship with him. Um, and ultimately, uh, throughout, the hospital, throughout the hospitalization, I saw him evolve and how his emotions evolved from, from fear and denial to grief once he received the diagnosis about chaos um, to acceptance that this was something that could be treated. Um, and it just really provided a reminder of um, the distinction between the disease or what someone has versus like the illness or what their perception and understanding is of that illness. So I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. Another reason why I really appreciate ideas, we really get a chance to um, hear the patient's story and social history. So I think that really is highlighted in this patient. Thank you for that really beautiful reflection, Alex. And I really appreciate you bringing this case and sharing the learning with all of us. So thank you so much. Um, before we end, I, I'll turn it over to Amalia and Annalise. And if you could each share maybe two learning points that you want um, all the learners listening to this to take away. Um, Amalia, maybe we'll go to you first. Um, I think the first one is just I'm just going to reiterate some things that we've said that I think are important to take away. So I think the first is just when you have someone with profound immunosuppression, whether that's advanced HIV or some other type of immunosuppression, um, it is super important to talk to the patient, get a really good thorough history, get a real review of systems. Don't just say that they're negative and do a really thorough exam because these patients can present with many different things going on at once, just as illustrated here. I'm sure there were many other things that were in this <laughs> patient's presentation. Um, so I do think that that's just a moment to pause and intentionally do that because you can have a big impact on patients. Um, and I think the other one is just uh, have a low threshold to think about ocular, otic, and neurosyphilis. <laughs> Um, so even let's say this person's LP had been completely normal, even if they still had eye symptoms, like it should still be thought about and acted upon. And so I think it's just easy to forget about that. So that's the only th other thing I'll say. Thank you. Uh, Annalise, which two learning points would you want to emphasize to the learners listening? I think the main thing for learners is uh, in a patient with profound immunosuppression, you're not, uh, you're generally not going to have one unifying diagnosis. Uh, so the opposite of Occam's razor, razor hickam stickum, I think people um, say it, uh, applies here. And I think this is a beautiful representation of that. Uh, many, many positives in the review of systems could equal many different diagnoses. Uh, and I think that the second thing is um, this, and a lot of what we do as ID docs um, is a very emotional part of our job. I think um, patients like this are extremely vulnerable. So this this person is probably very, very scared um, uh, about everything that's going on. Uh, uh, and I, I would say uh, approach all patients, but um, uh, these patients have a special place in my heart. Approach patients like him um, with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of caring and empathy and know that um, there is a, a host of um, likely trauma surrounding this um, and there's a lot to unpack and not just assume that they 
who are ignoring these symptoms and not taking care of themselves. Um, there's a lot of stigma, a lot of um, of shame that is associated with an HIV diagnosis um, everywhere, but here in the Southeast, that is compounded by a lot of different factors. So uh, just uh, uh, be caring, be compassionate, uh, be the doctors that we all want uh, you to be, uh, but know that um, these patients take take a lot of a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of uh, 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 challenges, um, and uh, it can also be very rewarding to to in the end to take care of these um, of these folks. Thank you so much. Well, um, before we end this end the session, I just want to thank you all, Annalise and Amalia, for truly a brilliant, brilliant discussion of this um, really complicated case and Alex for presenting it so expertly and for um, all of your really powerful re reflections and teaching. Uh, so thank you all so much and we'll end the session there, uh, but I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. And thank you very much. <laughs> Bye everyone.